Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the Dow Jones transport average with the silver price superimposed on top of it. The MACD is for the transportation average. And now the Dow is moving, looking like it's going to move into new highs, the Dow 30. But we can see here that the transports are definitely rolling over. They're nowhere near the trend line that goes back to 2009, but you can see there is a breakdown of the trend line from 2012. Now, I just put silver on there just to show you a comparison of, of how they've done. Also, this MACD rolling over and crossing through uh, the zero line, you can see that had not occurred since all the way back in 2011 when we got maybe a mini bear type thing. So that is significant. We know from Jesse Livermore that uh, certain parts of the market roll over before others. So can this bounce and go back up? Absolutely it can. And uh, I was just recently reading a PDF on the Weimar hyperinflation and what happens during that. And it was fascinating read. There, there were people who were practically penniless, but then they had some shares of stocks and those stocks were going through the roof. But as the stocks were going through the roof, the currency was crashing so fast that it couldn't even keep up. And we saw the same thing in Zimbabwe. It was the best returning stock market for an entire year, even though the currency ultimately became worthless. So this is interesting. We don't really have any activity with silver today, but it looks like this is going to roll over and go down. Will silver roll over and go down with it, or will silver reverse and go the opposite direction? My guess is the latter, but we can't say for sure. Now, I wanted to continue on with sort of a different topic. We're not going to talk about flat earth thing because that's kind of talked out, but I did want to talk a little bit about geocentrism. And we're, we're also going to look at uh, some scriptures about silver after we do that. But I wanted to introduce this concept of geocentrism. Now, the gentleman that we're going to be looking at his presentation, he, he's not a flat earth guy. He is a ball earth guy, and he, but he is a geocentrist. And it's very interesting because it gives you the history of the evolution of the thought in this area. But before we do that, I want you to look at this is what I would call a summary of the current belief system of the modern world. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state that nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. Wait, the earth began to cool, the autotrophs began to drool, Neanderthals developed tools, we built a wall. We built the pyramids, math, science, history, unraveling the mystery that all started with a big bang. And you know that show. That's a show that's big hit comedy series that's on TV right now. And it's typical of uh, these are uh, physics students and they're the smartest people in the room and all this stuff. And it's just filled with all the lies that you can possibly imagine about what people believe the Earth is and the universe is and where it came from and things like that. And it really is ridiculous. Uh, I want to show you the presentation of this gentleman that I came across today and watched it. And this is excellent because it gives you, uh, I'm just going to play a little part of it here. You should really watch the whole thing. But it's about the geocentric model. And it goes into the explanation and the history of all these gentlemen that were involved, all the way back from Newton, Kepler, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, um, Galileo, uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment, Aries failure, uh, Foucault, all these people, all the scientists who were involved. And believe it or not, there was a tremendous amount of testing. And we know that science is about testing. Uh, science isn't really about theory. That's the realm of philosophy or as far as just theorizing without proposing any tests. But what we're going to find out here is that there actually are a large number of tests that can be done. And this series, especially the first 45 minutes of it, will, goes through the history 
um, starting with uh, pre-Renaissance and all the way through to the modern age, including the Hubble telescope, explaining all of the tests that came up uh, as to whether we could verify whether the Earth is spinning around the sun, the sun and the Earth are moving through space, all this stuff that everybody believes is going on right now is actually happening. And believe it or not, you'll see through this that there were a large number of tests that were done and every single one of those tests came up with a negative. It showed that the Earth is fixed and that the Earth is not moving. And so what happened was there were ad hoc theories proposed to explain why those tests didn't show the Earth moving. And this is actually how we get to Einstein's theory of relativity, which, by the way, he shows that is completely, it's not only false, but it's completely fraudulent. And he shows from Einstein's own documents that it is fraudulent. And the only reason that it was proposed was because of the series of failures. But let's get a little bit of this history and we'll listen to a little bit of it. So the fringe, the fringes they get from their diffraction grating look like that. And when they turn it, they should find in the direction the Earth is moving, the fringes come closer together. And the difference, the fringe shift, is a measure of the speed at which we are moving. The direction for the maximum is the direction we're going. So we can get the direction and the speed. And everybody said, wonderful. Then they did the experiment. And to everybody's surprise, no friendship. Everybody shook their heads, walking and going, well, what must be happening? is the sun is moving around the universe at just the opposite speed to which the Earth is going around the sun. So the two motions have just cancelled out. But in six months' time, the Earth will be on the opposite side of the sun. Now they'll be moving together. We'll get a nice big friendship. shift. So they looked in six months' time. Shift. Still no friendship. shift. Other people did the experiment. They did it in Germany, they did it in America, they did it on the tops of mountains, they did it all over the place. All times of the day and night, all times of the year, and always no friendship. It's interesting to see what scientists have said about this. Adolf Baker, for example, failure to observe different speeds of light at different times of the year suggested that the Earth must be at rest. It was therefore the preferred frame for measuring absolute motion in space. Gian Colley said, but this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. Only with respect to the Earth would the speed of light be seen as predicted by Maxwell's equations. This is tantamount to assuming that the Earth is the central body of the universe. And Bernard Jaffe said, the data were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw, that the Earth was at rest. This, of course, was preposterous. So, of course, we have to look for another ad hoc theory. The physicists of the world were looking very hard, and a brilliant Irish physicist called Fitzgerald came up with the germ of an idea. He said, as a body moves through the ether, the pressure of the ether against it makes it squash up shortens the length. Now the apparatus that they've got, when they point it in the direction that we're going, the ether squashing into it makes it shorter. That's why there's no fringe shift. Now that idea was developed by an even more brilliant physicist, Anton Lorentz, in Holland. And he developed his theory, it was called the theory of relativity. And there not only did he have bodies being squashed in the length changing, he had clocks slowing down as they went faster. And using this theory of relativity, he was able to account for all the observations that showed the Earth stands still, so we could have it moving again. But then Thorndike and Kennedy did an experiment to check it out. A 
and it didn't work. They still had the Earth stationary. So it was then up to a genius called Albert Einstein to change Lorenz's theory so that he would explain von Mack and Kennedy. So now, instead of having bodies get shortened by pressing against the ether, he had space getting shorter. Now, what does that mean? He didn't have clocks slowing down because they're moving faster through the ether. He had time slowing down. Now, what does that mean? Well, whatever it means, it meant they could get over all the observations that said the Earth is stationary. So everybody said, terrific, good, we'll accept it. Even though nobody has ever actually understood it. Now, according to Einstein, we've still got the Earth hurtling through space at speed v. We've still got light impacting it with a speed c. On this side, the impact speed is c plus v but that is still equal to C. This light catching the Earth up, it arrives at C minus V, but it's still equal to C. Now, surely there's one solution. C plus V equals C equals C minus V means V must be north, the, north. the Earth can't be moving. But Einstein says, no, this is true for any value of V. Oh, my. Oh, well. At least it enables us to believe the Earth is moving, so let's believe it. But not everybody did believe it. There was a French scientist called Sagnac who said, now wait a minute, let's see if it really is true that C plus B equals C minus B. So he built a turntable, and he had a light source, and he had mirrors, it's actually not like this, his apparatus doesn't look like this, but this is a, a very simple illustration. And we have one beam going around clockwise, one beam going around anti-clockwise, and as long as this is not moving, we'll get no fringe shift. But now, if we spin this around, now we will have one beam of light chasing the motion, so it's going to arrive here at C minus V, and one going against the motion, it's the impact speed will be C plus V. Now let's see if Einstein's right. Do we get a fringe shift? And he did. C plus V is not equal to C, is not equal to C minus V. Einstein's wrong. Problem, that means the Earth stands still. Michelson did another experiment. This time with a chap called Gale. He did this in Chicago. It's actually a very large apparatus, about a kilometer in length, a kilometer in width. And the idea is that this beam, this section of his circuit, is closer to the equator than that. So the ether drift that it's going against is different, the speed there and the speed there. So one should get a fringe shift if there is an ether and if C plus B is equal to C minus B. So he did the experiment and he found a fringe shift. C plus B is not equal to C, is not C minus B. Einstein wrong again. How come we always hear about Einstein? We never hear about Sagnac. We never hear about Michelson and Gale. Well, the next person to make an input to this story is Edwin Hubble. You've probably heard of the Hubble telescope. Well, this is not the Hubble telescope. This is the telescope that Edwin Hubble worked on. And he found that the further a galaxy appeared to be, i.e. the fainter it is, therefore presumably the further away it is, the more its spectrum was shifted towards the red end. And this <coughs> is so whatever direction he pointed his telescope. So all around the Earth, the further away you go, the more red shifted the spectrum. The Earth is surrounded by concentric shells of red shift. 
Now, everybody said this must mean that everything is rushing away from us. And the further they are away, the faster they're going away from us. It's called the Doppler effect. That means the Earth is a center from which everything is expanding. Now, people don't like the Earth being the center of anything. So there was a found a way to use Einstein's funny mathematics to explain this all away so that... So ah, you, you there you go. It. There is uh, just a brief section of this. It's a very long two-hour video. I encourage you to watch the entire thing. You can see that what we have today is not science. And these people are not scientists because their theories are all ad hoc theories. Every single test that has been devised to try to prove whether or not the Earth is moving has shown that the Earth is not moving. And that's a large number of experiments. And every single time what they've done is come up with an ad hoc theory. They've changed their theory to explain away the results of the experiment. That is not science. And that's what we have today. You have the same thing in evolution. Um, no matter what tests they come up with to try to show this would prove it to be true or this would prove it to be false, once that test is uh, administered or the evidence is looked for is not found or is found, then the test is explained away. And that's why we have now the theory of punctuated equilibrium because Darwin proposed that the fossil record would show transitionary forms, but the fossil record shows absolutely zero transitionary forms. And Darwin said this is an absolute uh, death knell for my theory if the fossil record doesn't support it. But of course, what they did was they proposed the theory of punctuated equilibrium. What they said was that the changes happen in rapid spurts and then they stop happening. So it doesn't get caught by the fossil record. Of course, uh, that goes against their slow change over billions of years and it goes against everything else. Now, another very interesting aspect to this is the fact that he, and he'll explain it in this video, is that Charles Lyell, the original old earth uh, geologist, who was a predecessor of Darwin, and Darwin's theories were based on Lyell, actually there's a connection between Copernicus, Galileo, Lyell, Darwin, and all of these theories, ultimately Einstein. And of course, we know that these theories rejected the biblical model of the universe. And this is actually, this video is taken from... Uh, the Flat Earth Controversy by Rob Skiba. I think he's still on the fence, but he gives a tremendous presentation uh, about it. It's very, very good. So you should, def I'll link that as well. Um, but the point is, is that this is not science. What they're doing is they're dismissing the results of scientific tests because they don't like the results. And the fact is, is that the results actually support what the Bible says, literally. What people believe for thousands of years, that's what the science shows is true. Um, but that's unacceptable to them because they don't want to be accountable to a creator. That's the bottom line. That's the only reason people believe in evolution, because there is no science behind it. And that's the only reason they believe in heliocentrism, because there is no scientific basis for it whatsoever. But the implications of geocentrism being true and creationism being true, they can't abide those implications. And so that's what's behind it all. Now, I wanted to take you to the Bible because that's what is uh, proven by these things and talk a little bit about silver. Now, one of the verses, I did Bible verses on silver before, and this is one I just wanted to point out here. This is one that is about the judgment of Babylon, and it actually gives a listing of the riches that Babylon has. Now, what's very important about this, besides the list of the riches of Babylon is that those riches were generated by trade. Now that's what we're actually seeing break down in the world economy right now. That's the slowdown that you're seeing when you look at, you know, you see the differences between the different money supply 
charts and then you look at the Baltic Dry Index or you look at some of those other things that show that trade has collapsed and is, is staying collapsed. Trade is the basis of wealth. And it's a real simple uh, math to do. Obviously, certain parts of the world are best places to grow certain crops. Certain parts of the world are the best place to mine certain things. Uh, certain populations are better to manufacture things, whether that's because of a political reason or depressed wages or slavery or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, but what will happen is that if world trade is allowed to flourish, then wealth is the result of that. That's what we see here in this um, verse. Now, I'm going to read the the list of things here. The, these are the the merchandise, the the types of material that are traded that led to the wealth of Babylon, or I should say in the future, will lead to the wealth. And here they are. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, Thyene wood, all manner of vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood, brass, iron, marble, cinnamon odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, flour, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, chariots, slaves, souls of men. Now, of course, what's interesting here is the most valuable thing is gold. And right there, we have silver is second. Third is precious stones and then pearls. So here are your precious metals and your gems. Um, precious metals are valued more highly than gems. Now, the other thing that you have to remember here that this list, this is the list of men, how men value things. And you can actually turn this list around and find that, uh, that that's actually the opposite of how God values things. So for men, the most valuable things are gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. Uh, and the least valuable things are horses, chariots, uh, slaves, and souls of men. That does not bode well for the future, that they will be buying and selling the souls of men. But that's what the Bible tells us. Now, God, on the other hand, values things in the exact opposite order. The most valuable thing in the universe is the soul of a man. And we've been told that uh, what can a man give for his soul? Uh, if he acquired the wealth of the entire world, could he pay the price, the ransom of his own soul? No, he couldn't ransom his own soul with the wealth of the entire world. And then we have slaves. So men are the most valuable thing to God. And then we have animals. So very, very interesting. We know that this is in the future. We know that silver and gold are very, very valuable uh, silver is right behind gold as far as value. This will be so in the future. We know that because we know what the future is going to be because we're told what it's going to be. Now I want to look at one other verse here that mentions silver. And this one's actually from the Old Testament. And this is Zechariah 14.4. 14, and this is a prophecy about the nations uh, coming against Jerusalem. And we know that the Armageddon will be all nations brought against Israel. And that's when the Lord will return. You can see right here it says, And this shall be the plague wherein the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And uh, so we're talking about Armageddon here. Um, but then we can see here it says, And Judah sh also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. So you can see here that we have a prophecy about the wealth coming to Israel. Now we know in Solomon's time um, that the Bible says that silver was heaped up like the dust. It was accounted nothing in the time of Solomon. Uh, they actually give the the amount of gold, but there was so much silver that uh, it, it couldn't be counted. But again, it was second most valuable. Uh, that just simply means that they were so wealthy 
that uh, silver wasn't really that important. They didn't make their vessels. Uh, you can read how Solomon's vessels were all made of gold. That's only uh, in a nation that is extremely wealthy. We know that virtually all the wealth in the world, uh, as far as precious metals, uh, a very large amount of it was accumulated in Israel at that time. It did not last uh, for very long at all because of Solomon's disobedience. But at one time, uh, all the wealth of the world was flowing into Jerusalem. And that's going to happen again. So we know what that wealth is. That wealth is starts with gold and silver. So just as we have a unerring testimony about what the earth is, what its place in the universe is, and what's going to be happening in the future. We also have a witness as to what money is, what wealth is, and what it will be in the future. And it really doesn't matter how many of these pseudoscientists or people coming up with theories, we'll call it science, falsely so-called. It doesn't really matter what they say. It doesn't change the fact uh, that the scientific tests prove that the Bible is true and the true Bible says that silver is the second most important asset in the world. And we'll talk to you next time.